Here we go, back in Ephesians chapter 2. We have been in this passage 8, 9, and 10. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What a momentous statement that is. This is our salvation. This is how you become a Christian. By grace. It's God choosing you. It's God drawing you. It's God bringing you. And, and grace means in spite of you. I, I love that part. Because if you knew me, you would love that part too. You know? It's not of ourselves. There's no place for boasting. It's not like we're walking around, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, oh yeah, you should see my faith, oh yeah, you should. No, there's no place for boasting, because it's nothing of you. It's all of him. And this is the whole package of salvation, if you will. It's a gift from God. We don't always look at it that way, do we? You know? How we should be glorying in that idea. And today I want to focus on verse 10. Because verse 10 just really brings it home. He says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What's it mean to be a Christian? It means that we are God's handiwork. We are God's artistic design artistic work and that is the truth about all Christians and that is the truth about the Christian church and because that's true it is our business to begin to think of ourselves in that way and it's only as we think of ourselves in that way that we will actually walk out Christianity we, we come out of the factory, you know, if you will. We, we come from our your mother's wombs so ruined and so twisted by this world that we always view Christianity in a wrong way. We, we always begin to think of Christians as, as people who are trying to do good. Oh, it's those people that go to that church over there. It's, it's you know... It's trying or, or obeying or, or, you know, we put it into all of these terms and, and that is so hopelessly short of what God tells us that we are. The New Testament Christians are constantly being exhorted to realize the privilege of their position. We are but a handful of people scattered in a great pagan society and we are told to rejoice because we've been brought into that wonderful destiny that is ahead of us we're told to lift up our heads you know to see things from above instead of below or walk in a triumphal manner through this world but I, I I got to ask you a question. Are we filled with this sense of privilege, with this sense of joy, knowing that we are in God's hand? What's your understanding of a Christian? What is your understanding of the Christian church? For most of us, most of the time, we think in merely human terms, don't we? We always jump back to these world, worldly terms because we live in the world. We're physical people, you know. Don't you think of the church as just some kind of normal institution? Oh yeah, it's just a group. It's just a bunch of people that kind of believe the same thing and they, they go over there. We think of Christians as people who just want to do a little better than their neighbor, you know. Just believe certain things. Shouldn't we rather think of ourselves as a part of God's great process? God's great plan. 
Look at the term that the apostle uses in this verse. He says, we are God's workmanship. This is the first and greatest thing you must come to realize when you, when you look at a Christian, when you think about a Christian, or when you are a Christian. Or when you're in the Christian church. We are His workmanship. We are God's artistic design. His handiwork. We're a thing of His making. That's so different than the way I think about it because I think I'm a thing of my making. It's my decisions and it's my actions and it's my will and it's my doing and it's my, you know, and I get myself all into that thing. Doesn't it stir you to know you're a thing of his making? <laughs> Being formed and fashioned into something that God himself adores. God himself wants. Most of us don't think that way. We think that in my life and in my faith, God is mostly inactive. God is mostly passive until I pray or until I show up or until I do something and then he involves. You know, sure, uh, uh, of course, I'll pray. And then he will talk with me and he will answer me. But the problem with that way of thinking is it makes Christianity all about us, all about our activity, all about what we do. It's like we think of God as Santa Claus. We think of God as a great treasure house. But he really does nothing until we go to him. And then he will give to us. And then he will respond to us. And we make God the responder. And that is absolutely unbiblical. God is never the responder. God is the initiator. When we think that way, you know, oh, I remember back in 93, I made a decision for Christ, you know. And he justified me because I made this decision. And then, and then I went on for a while, and man, I really want to be sanctified. I really want to start living a better life. And so I put in the effort, and he sanctified me. And you go on and on in that way, and you think it's you doing something and him responding. You doing something and him responding. We're the responders. He's the initiator. We've got it backwards. We're looking at things wrongly. Read verse 10 again. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Christianity is entirely the result of God's activity. <laughs> Ouch. Sometimes that hurts to say that because it takes me clear out of the picture, you know? You remember how it all started. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Hmm. It was his activity. And then God made man, and then man fell. Genesis 3. It took that long, you know? Genesis chapter 3. And then God pursued. God enacted a plan to pursue man. God went after him. So God calls a man called Abraham. God brings prophets. He brings priests. He brings kings. He brings Moses. He brings the law. He brings the tabernacle. He brings all of these things. And he shows us all of these things. He gives instruction about worship. It was God who so loved us that he sent his only begotten son. You still think you're the initiator? No, it's God's workmanship. And it's his plan from beginning to end. This idea that God is waiting for us can't be found in the Bible. 
these verses ask us to stand back for a minute. Stand back for a minute. Take a look at the grand purpose and the grand picture because God is bringing forth something. God is doing something. <laughs> He's bringing something brand new into creation. And it should be wondrous. Can you imagine standing there when God said, let there be light, and there was light? Can you imagine the glory that would have, you would have just been astounded when that happened? When he speaks and creation comes into existence, and yet we're his new creations in Christ Jesus, and we're not astounded at that. We think somehow that's normal. That is not normal at all. It's amazing. These verses portray God as an artisan, as an artist, in a great workshop. Look at Isaiah 64, 8. He says, But now, O Lord, you are our Father, and we are the clay. You are the potter. Boy, you get that picture? And all we are the work of your hands. Jeremiah 18, beautiful passage about going to the potter's house. He tells Jeremiah, go to the potter's house. I want to show you something there. And Jeremiah goes and it says, then I went down to the potter's house and there he was making something at the wheel. So here's this potter and he's got the wheel spinning and you know, he's messing with the clay and he's doing stuff. And he goes on and he says, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter so he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. And then God asked Jeremiah a question, O house of Israel, can I not do this with, do this to you as the potter has done? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in my hands. We are the clay. We were buried in this world. Right? And God reached in and took out a lump of clay, you, and brought you into his workshop and began to work on you. <laughs> You're in his hand. And then he will put you on his wheel. Then he will fashion you and mold you and shape you and turn you into a vessel that he desires. The artist is producing a work of art. It's even deeper and more graphic than that. In Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Created. Now here's this idea. He takes us all the way back to creation and he says, what, what is creation? Creation is making something out of nothing. It was not there and now it is there. We're now being brought into being. None of this fits with our foolish ideas that a Christian is just someone who, who's about a little self-improvement. Just able to you know, able to perform, you know, certain laws or rules or functions better than other people. Mm -hmm. That is not it at all. What this plainly says is that God is this great artisan and creator, and he is bringing something into your life that was not there before. And that is what makes you a Christian. I cannot be a Christian without God working in me, for me, through me, doing this, whatever he's doing. You know, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For it is the God, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in these earthen vessels, in these jars of clay, if you will, that we walk around in. That the excellence and the power may be of God and not of us. Did you catch all that? 
He's doing a work in you. He's put a work inside of you. He's put his life into you. And he's, he's recreating you. Not so you can walk around and go, Ooh, look at me. No. So all the glory goes to him. Do you see that the way we regard ourselves as Christians is very much a travesty? Being a Christian isn't that I'm striving to do better or trying harder to maintain a certain goal or a certain level. It isn't my dress or my attendance or the church I attend. It isn't any of this stuff. It isn't my morality. There are highly moral people that don't believe in Jesus Christ at all. It is not that. No, it is God's hand upon me. Creating in me something brand new. Forming me into something he desires. It's his artistic ability. Not my moral fortitude. You know? We've got to stop thinking of ourselves in terms of what we do and how we act and what we, we, we see ourselves as. But rather think of what God is doing in us. <laughs> I am in the hands of creator God. You are in the hands of an almighty creator. He took nothing and built everything. Don't you think he can take the nothing in you and build amazing things? And he is busy right now doing that work. How does God do that work? You ever, you ever wonder about that? Well, firstly, he does it all through the Lord Jesus Christ. Created in Christ Jesus, he says. Now, we've already looked at that in verses 4 through 7. We already took note of how the Christian has died with Christ. How he rose with Christ. He was risen to new life. He's been quickened, made alive. He's been raised with him. He's been seated with him in heavenly places. All those things are completed works. They're finished works. So God makes us Christians by applying to us what he has done for Christ. We receive the benefits of his life, his righteous life, his righteousness now is imputed to us. We are clothed in his righteousness, not my righteousness, his. And we receive the benefits of his death. And he is forming Christ in us. It says in Galatians 4.19, My little children, for whom I labor in birth until, again, until Christ is formed in you. At this point, we're well beyond our ability to keep rules and laws. Well beyond that. This is God's handiwork. Have you ever gone on a factory tour or some artisan's workshop? You know, when I was a high schooler, I was an artist, and we went down to Salt Lake and went to several colleges and stuff. But we also went to some art studios. And I went to this guy, Don Doxy was his name, and a great artist, sculptor and painter and just amazing. You walk into his workshop, and you see the finished works, you know? And you're like... This guy is amazing what he can do with just a lump of clay or just this or just a few paints or a few whatever. And you walk by and you're looking at his brushes and they're the same brushes I have at home. You know, you're looking at his stuff. Oh, I got those paints at home. I got this, you know, but I can't do that. The first thing that strikes you is the raw materials the artist uses. <laughs> and what does God use? A lump of clay. We are but dust. God takes us this lump of clay and he, he brings along the Holy Spirit oh the majesty of the word of God when you read through it you know the father has this great plan and then he turns it over to the son and the son works it out 
accomplishes perfect righteousness, goes to the cross and dies on the cross as the offering. And by his blood, by his death, he's now able to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then both the Father and the Son send forth the Holy Spirit who now applies that to your life. So God wants to fashion us after his Son, being conformed into the image of his Son. That's, that's the purpose. That's what we're, Christianity, Christians are becoming, you know. And this is the Holy Spirit's job. Can you imagine that job? You know you. You look yourself in the mirror every day and you go, oh, oh mercy. You know? Can you imagine the job of taking you from who you are and what you are right now? Being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't want that job. Mercy, no. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And he's not just working on me. That's a full-time job. He's working on Ray over here, you know? Working on Rhonda. He's working on some people. So he's taking you, he's taking me, and he's conforming these raw materials into the image of Christ. 1 Corinthians 6.19 Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? He has moved inside of you so he can rearrange you. Change doesn't happen from the outside in. Oh, if you just change the way you dress and change the way you do this and change the way you do that, never happens. You want real happen? You want real change? It's got to start inside. That's why the Holy Spirit comes inside. There's this constant activity in the Christian by the Holy Spirit day in, day out. He is working in every individual Christian and he is working in every individual church. Christian church. And what he does is he uses the Word of God. Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 17 says this, Sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. Need to clean up your life? You need to get your life straight? How's that going to happen? God's Word. James 1.18 Of his own will he brought us forth by the Word of truth. Did you catch that? He brought us forth. He recreated us. He, he born us again. He gave us life again. How? By the word of truth? 1 Peter 1.23 Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. So God uses his word to give us life. The word is read, the word is preached, and that becomes life to us. It's like a seed. And inside that seed, that seed can lie dormant on your cabinet, you know, on your countertop for years. But as soon as it's in the right environment and it senses moisture and warmth and all this stuff, boom, sprouts up, takes off, life happens. The Word of God is like seed. So God's life comes into us. How? By God putting His Word into us. <laughs> the importance of this, the importance of the Bible, the importance of your, your bringing it in. You know, that clay that the potter is using. You know what they do when they bring in clay, they add moisture, they keep it in a moist environment, they, they sprinkle it with moisture, and then when they put it on the wheel, they're constantly taking that sponge and running moisture all over. Why? Because if you're just a dry old lump of clay, trying to get you to conform doesn't work very well. You know what the picture of the water is, right? The washing of the water of the Word, Ephesians. The Word of God is the water that makes you soft and supple and pliable. Able, you know, then, then the Master is able to stretch you out, form you in, you know. Without the Word, 
the clay becomes hard and dry. <laughs> and it will just crumble under his touch. Why is it important to read your Bible? Why is it important to come and listen to some idiot preacher, you know, telling you about the Word of God? Because God himself uses his Word to bring life into you. He was careful to have the Holy Spirit move upon these men who wrote the Word of God. To open their minds. To see the truths he wanted them to put down. And he oversaw every word. All scriptures were given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and understanding. You know, all of that stuff, right? Every word of God is God breathed, is what that says. Ephesians 4.11 For he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastor teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Do you see the end result? That we would be the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. So you walk into God's workshop and what do you see in there? You see apostles. I want you to take note that there were 12 apostles. There is no one today who can call themselves an apostle biblically. They were one set apart by Jesus Christ himself. They saw the Lord himself. You see prophets. Oh, I thank God for the prophets. Jeremiah and Isaiah. Ezekiel, you know. There are evangelists, people out there powerfully sharing the word of God. And then there are pastor teachers. <laughs> I started out as a teacher, now I'm a pastor teacher. It's a weird idea. All of these are God's gifts to the church. And he is using them to fashion men and women into wonderful creations of God. You ever watch a, a sculptor, you know, a potter, and they're working the wheel and they get to this certain place and they reach over and they grab a tool. You know, maybe it's this tool that's got a big curve on it and they lay it along the side and it gets that nice shape. And so, I'm just a tool in God's hands, that's all I am. I'm just a tool helping to shape you. But really, you're under his hands. You're in his, you're on his wheel. So God calls men to preach his word. Preaching isn't a profession. Preaching is a calling. Unfortunately, today, it's become a profession. Oh, I think I'm going to go be this. And so you go to seminary, you get your degree, and out you go. Did God call you to do that? Is he behind that? Or are you behind that? It's a great question. You see, God has it all planned out. He has you all planned out. He has your blueprint. And he's working it out right there, right now, this morning. This preaching and teaching of the word of God is a gift that he has given to the church. And it's not to elevate one man above, above all of you guys. I'm sorry, I'm just as much an idiot as you are. So that can't be it, you know? But it's to bring us all into this unity. There can't be unity if I'm above you. There can't be unity if there's some kind of schism, you know? And into the place where we all come to the understanding, where we all come to understand what God is doing in each one of us. Are we different? Absolutely. Are we supposed to be? Absolutely. Look at creation. Look at how many different kinds of trees there are. They're all trees. They all have different functions. 
even the same kind of tree still looks different. You know, you have a Charlie Brown Christmas tree and you have the beautiful one at Rockefeller Center, you know. But we find another element happening in a workshop. In Hebrews chapter 12, we find the writer telling us, Hebrews 12, 6, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. Have you noticed that some Christians walk around kind of grumbly? They got a little complainy action going on. I'm not very happy where God has me, and things are going on, and I don't like them, and you know, you get into all of this stuff. I, I don't like the struggle. <laughs> but the writer of Hebrews tells them that that struggle is proof that you're in God's hand. It's proof. You going through stuff? Well, get used to that, Christian. Because Christians are either in the middle of a struggle, just coming out of a struggle, or just going into a struggle. Right? That's the three positions of a Christian. I love those two days where I'm coming out. <laughs> His illustration in Hebrews is that of earthly parents. He says, man, we've all had earthly parents, and they disciplined us. You remember those days? Get you playing in the road again, boy. I'm going to play on your backside, you know? And then you got played on your backside. And it was painful, and you didn't enjoy it. But you learned some lessons there. And they disciplined because they wanted that child to grow up. They wanted that child to have a future and a hope. And your Heavenly Father wants to do the same thing with you. Now that doesn't mean every time something goes wrong in your life, it's God disciplining you. That is, is not what the, the message is, because we live in a fallen world, and it's full of corruption and evil and hardship. And, you know, a lot of times it can just be that stuff. It can just be life happening. But uh, there are some times when we become unresponsive to his word. When he's trying to lay something on your heart and he goes, Mark, would you stop doing that? And you're like, but I really like doing that. You know, and so I'm just going to kind of ignore you, God, and go about, oh, I'm still trying to be a good little boy. But then uh, I have this, you know, little play, player over here. And um, it, it's funny because uh, he will take you out to the woodshed. I don't know if you've ever been taken to the woodshed. No, back in my day, this was a common thing, you know. My dad wore a belt not to keep his pants up. My dad wore a belt. And the last thing you wanted was a 6'4 man, 320 pounds, with a belt in his hand coming after you. That's the last thing in the world you wanted. So, you know, it tended to change your attitude, what you did. See, God is producing perfect articles. Perfect. <laughs> Are you there yet? Oh, mercy. How do we know if we're in God's hands? How do you know? How do you know if you're one that's under construction or not? I, I think it's pretty easy. The first thing is you have a sense that God is doing something to you. <laughs> Your conscience becomes aware that something's askew, something's going on. I was fine and walking along in my life and doing what I wanted to do, and suddenly I'm uncomfortable. Suddenly there's a disturbance in my life. <clears throat> and I'm being convicted of, of a couple of things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Suddenly... <clears throat> or gradually we become aware that there's something has changed about us one minute I'm happy with my life and then suddenly there's some things that are just driving me crazy about myself questions begin to arise in your mind and, and questions I don't always like Where do those questions, where do those thoughts, where do those things come from? Can I just suggest to you 
that they are coming from the Holy Spirit. They're not coming from you because you want you to be happy. You would never bring those thoughts into your own mind. You keep those things way out there. But the Holy Spirit brings them. And when he brings them, you try to run from them. I don't know if you ever did that. But you run back into your old life hard, you know. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, and you're busy running this way. But that hound of heaven will not let you go. He's right there in those same thoughts, those same things. Just keep coming up. You realize that no one becomes a Christian without that little experience. <laughs> and that is great proof that God has plucked you out of the, the field and has put you on his will and is beginning to deal with you. He digs you up from the ground, out of this earth, out of this world, takes hold of you in his hands kind of roughly, you know, get you ready, and plunk down on that wheel. His foot starts going and the wheel starts going and oh boy, here we are. Life is just spinning now. And the potter has a design for you. The next step most of us go through, I, th I think all of us go through, is he begins to bring enlightenment to you. He the Holy Spirit begins to reveal some truths, some truths about God and some truths about yourself. And the truths about God are, are fun. The truths about yourself are uncomfortable. Mark, you're an idiot. Well, you don't have to say it like that. You can just say, I'm unique. I'm different, you know? But no, he, you know, suddenly I'm aware that I've been a jerk my whole life, you know? I, I have this issue, and I have these issues, and I've got this, and God loves me, and wants me. And these two things can't go together. How can I be a jerk and God love me? And I, you know, and we go through this thing where our brain, you know? Our brain gets, dare I say, washed, you know? Romans 12, you know? By the renewing of your mind, you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. These thoughts, these issues come in, you begin to think. And who, who's, who's doing that? The Holy Spirit's doing that. As newborn babes, Peter would say, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And suddenly here comes this desire for the pure milk I feel like I should read the Bible. I remember one weekend, you know, I went up Palisades Lakes, went camping over a weekend, I go up there, and God was somebody in my life, but not really the guy in my life, you know? And a day later, I come down off of that hill, and the first thing I want to do is go to church. The first thing I want to do is open my Bible. The first thing I want to do is get to know this guy. What happened on that hill? I still can't explain it. But I had this whole new outlook. In spite of myself, I knew that was, there was this black hole, you know. But suddenly I, I realized that God loved this black hole and I couldn't figure out why and I needed to figure out why. And so, you know, off I go. And we discover that we are no longer who we once were. <laughs> do, you, do you have that? Can you look back on your BC days, before Christ days? <laughs> Some of us don't like to look that far back, you know. That black hole is really, really evident there, you know. But do you remember? Something drastic has taken place in just me. And, you know, I, I don't know how. We're on the potter's wheel. There's a definite design in mind. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has planned out and designed out you, where you will walk and what your life will consist of. Some people hate that. Oh, I love that. 
You've been predestined and foreordained. What I love about that is God has set a boundary around my life and I want to reach it. I want to figure out where it is and I want to get there. This is conforming you into the image of Christ. So we find ourselves unhappy with our actions. <clears throat> I can't seem to do it. Unhappy with our behavior. Excuse me. Guess I'm going to have to do it. A little baptism while I'm up here. <clears throat> Sorry. We, we know God is changing. We, can, we know God is <clears throat> working on us. And pretty soon we go, oh God, I want more of that. Oh God, bring, just, just change me. You know, if you're going to do it, let's do it. Let's get it over with, you know. <clears throat> we want to be like him. Where'd that come from? I lived 30 years, never did that, you know. I want to act like him. I want to walk like him. I want to talk like him, you know. We discover what he, what he tells us on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, I don't know how you read that. And oh, how happy. Oh, how to be praised is the one who is poor in spirit. Who knows he's got nothing in himself. Oh God, every time I come to you, I just need, I'm, I'm this black hole and I just need, you know? I'm bringing nothing to this process. <clears throat> I set out, I'm gonna read my Bible, I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna obey and do, and you know, that lasts like 20 minutes and you're like, that all blew up and I don't know what's going on. You know, blessed are those who mourn. <sighs> Why would they be blessed? Because they find nothing in themselves. There's this desperate condition in them. Oh God, I need you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness because they have discovered there's none of that in themselves. I must go looking for it and there's only one place to go looking for righteousness. God. We discover Immediately, when you run to God, you are full of His righteousness. You've been clothed in His righteousness. It's an immediate thing. Hmm. This, this is the life we've been created for, been recreated for. A life totally dependent upon Him. <laughs> our Lord and our Savior. For without him, we can do nothing, the Bible says. But with him, all things are possible. All things. See, he's got his hand on your life. All things are possible. And we come to really understand this is a process. Sure, a lot of things happen that first moment. New life. New mind. New awakening. Just... Oh, but man, there's this process that follows that's just endless. Doesn't happen overnight. It's a lifetime <clears throat> of God working on your life. I mean, think about some of the changes you read about in the Bible. Think about the Apostle Paul. Saul of Tarsus. Here's this persecutor of the church. He wanted to eliminate the church. He wanted to get rid of Jesus and everybody that believed in Jesus. And he would, he would come with his people and they would threaten you and put the tip of the sword to your throat and say, deny Christ, blaspheme the name of Christ or die right now. And then one day, you know, on the road to Damascus, you know, this, this image this personage, brighter than the noonday sun in the Mideast, speaks to him and knocks him off of his donkey and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul goes, who are you? And then he starts thinking about it. Somebody's speaking to me, angelic form. It's got to be God. Look at the glory. Who are you, Lord? <laughs> oh, I'm Jesus. You know, the one you're persecuting? Oh, boy, am I in trouble, you know? And you're thinking, oh, suddenly, black smoke, done with that guy, let's move on. No. What's he do? Transforms that guy. 
And he becomes what? The apostle of grace. Oh, yeah, because he understands grace. I was deserving of nothing but hell's hottest flames for working against God. And he saved me and gave me eternal life and brought me into his kingdom. Oh, no, I'm the... I'm, and he now loves Gentiles. Where did they come from? Or you take John. John, one day, walking with the Lord, he goes into Samaria, into this town, and the town won't receive him because he's a Jew. And he comes back out and he, he says to Jesus, Lord, would you allow me to be like Elijah and call down fire from heaven and just smoke this town? And he becomes the apostle of love. How did that happen? Oh, a lifetime of being on God's wheel. Being under the washing of the water of the word. Molding and shaping. Or Peter, Mr. Foot and Mouth. You guys all know him, right? He had the answer for everything and it was always wrong. You know, it's just terrible. And then on Pentecost, he preaches and 3,000 people get saved. What happened there? You know, preaches a couple days later, a couple more thousand get saved. And you're just, man, what happened to him? Oh, he's on the wheel. God's got a hold of this guy. How did they become totally different people? God's workmanship. <laughs> Need I go on? What about you? Oh, B.C. Mark. Oh. Praise God you don't know him. First church I attended, I went in and the piano player was a girl I went to high school with. And she's there looking at me, looking at me. And after service, I walk up. I say, hey, how you doing? And she goes, you know, I heard of Mark Paulson got saved. I knew it couldn't be you. Our apostle, Paul, is telling us that when you become aware that God is working on you, you should have great assurance. You should be just amazed that God would lay his hand, that God would choose your lump of clay to put on his will and become some artistic design for his glory. Being confident of this very thing, Philippians tells us, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. See, God doesn't start something and leave it half done. God doesn't start something and go, this one isn't working, and throw it over in the corner. No. God will complete you. He will complete me. That is both wonderful and terrifying. That is wonderful because it's an absolute promise of God. It's going to happen. He is going to complete you. The terrifying part is I get involved. I resist. I struggle against it. I don't like this. I don't like where you're putting me. I don't like where I'm going. And I begin to resist. And when I resist, he brings chastening. Oh, have you ever been chastened by the Lord? You see, he's not casting me out. No, he's going to complete. He's going to complete me. He may have to thump me. He may have to totally change. <gasps> Starting over. Here we go. You know? He may have to crush me or break me. He may have to do some crazy things in my life. But he's going to do it because he is going to complete me. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will in no ways cast out. I will never take them off my wheel and throw them in the corner. I will never leave you or forsake you, ever. That is his promise. But he will gently break you to pieces. He will gently flood you drowned you seemingly. 
We're just clay in His hands. <laughs> I want that work to be soft and gentle and me to be ready for it. So what do I do? I read the Word of God. Man, I study the Word of God. I'm in the Word of God. I'm soaked with it. So this clay is just malleable, you know. It just forms. It just, oh God, you want to go there? Let's go there, you know. So in closing, let me ask you a couple of questions. Are you aware that that's happening to you? Because you should be sitting here in your chair, shaking your head, going, oh, some days I wish it wasn't. Some days I'm totally fascinated that it is. But yes, I'm aware. <laughs> Can you say that you are God's workmanship? Are you aware you're right there? His fingerprints are all over you now. You're being cha changed. You're being conformed. You're being made into something unique and beautiful. Have you become convinced that there is no such thing as faith without works? Now, I don't mean what the world holds you accountable to. I don't mean what other religions hold you accountable to. Oh, they want to see you walk out the law. Oh, so you got to be moral and you got to be straight. And, you gotta, and we should, right? That is not what God got a hold of you for. No, read the New Testament. I want you to be poor in spirit. Oh, have you become that? Oh, that is the most amazing work. To know that there's nothing deserving, nothing of honor that comes in this package. Only what he does through me ever works out for anything. Oh, are you meek? Are you merciful? Are you hungering and thirsting after righteousness? These are the sort of works God is interested in. Think about the fruit of the Spirit. Spirit of God now dwells in you. What's the fruit of that Spirit? Love. And it's not worldly love. Don't get that mind, get that out of your mind. It's agape love. It's God's love. Sacrificial love. Joy. Oh, come on, Christians. Joy. Being able to laugh. Being able to just sit here and in your heart know he has me and I am safe and I am in his hands and that brings joy. Love, joy, peace. You got any of that in your life? Patience, or the better word is long-suffering. Those two words should never go together. Yet in a Christian there can be long and suffering along with peace and joy and love. Kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And there's no law about these things. No, because this is the law. What's the greatest completion of the law you could ever do? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, might, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, that's it. That's the goal line. That is what I want people to do. And I always look at the cross. Because what's the first thing you've got to do? You've got to do the vertical thing. You've got to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, might, mind, and strength. And I've never met anybody that does that. There might be somebody. I've never met them. Oh, I want to. but my strength gets in the way. Oh, I'm weak, I'm feeling bad. My mind gets in the way. Oh, it's Sunday and the game's gonna be on. You know, you get all of these things that get in my way. Heart, might, mind, and strength. And somewhere along that path, you discover, oh, I'm loving God, I'm loving God. Oh, look at all these people. And I need to love them as I love this.
God has foreordained these good works for you to walk in. He's placed them out in front of you. He's given you that obnoxious neighbor. Do you have that one? Maybe you've got a Teresa Gibbs listen look at the next door, you know. And she's got the Christmas decorations, you know, it's like you're on, you know, vacation. And they gotta hit the old nuclear backup to run all the lighting and stuff, you know. You're trying to go to sleep. Lights are glaring in your window. <laughs> oh, mercy. Bottom line is, do you desire more of him and less of you? Oh, is that your heart's cry? <laughs> then may it please the Lord to bring that into our lives. Father, we come. Lord, we come. Balls of clay. Lumps of clay in your hands. And God, we ask you to do your artistic work with us. Let us become what you have in mind. Let us be made, sculpted, and, and you know, painted, and whatever it is you're doing. Lord, into the image that you have in mind and not the one we have in mind. God, let us humble ourselves and come meek and empty, hungering and thirsting for you. And Lord, just surrendering and saying, Lord, whatever you have is best. I know that you will withhold no good thing from me. So Lord, have your way. Because your way is always the best way. Father, we bring you all praise and honor and glory. And we do it through the name of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.